Good morning and blessed Sabbath. It's, um, it's a uh, privilege and a pleasure to see all of you. As Brother Tyron said, we welcome all of you and those who are for the first time visiting this church. You are very welcome. <clears throat> those who are watching online uh, via live stream, you are welcome as well from this country where different parts of this globe. Today I'd like to share the last uh, message from a series of uh, messages on the life of Joseph. So most of you have been present when we had this opportunity to share the life of Joseph and the life of Christ. The trials of Joseph and the trials Christ had to go through it's very similar. Actually, Joseph is a portrait of Christ in the Old Testament. And today, we, we would la like to look at the last chapters um, uh, from this story or from this life of Joseph. And um, I do believe that there are many things that we would that are a good lesson for us and they are uh, quite uh, embedded in the Bible to tell us something about this young man, how he was separated from his father at, at an early age, 17 years old, and then lived his life in Egypt, serving in the house of Potiphar, then being put in jail, uh, wrongly accused, and then he became <clears throat> the prime minister of Egypt, second, uh, second position in the empire after Pharaoh. And then last time we studied, I, I'm just recapping a little bit from the last message. And last message we studied how Joseph forgave his siblings. How Joseph was providing for them by God's providence. And then we came to the point <clears throat> when he had to send them back and said, go and bring that old man. Go and bring my father. Here I have enough food and here I will provide for you. I will prepare for you a place, similar, similar language to what Christ says in John 14. I will go and prepare a place. Joseph was preparing a place for his family and for his siblings in Egypt. A temporary place, but Christ will prepare us something eternal where we can reign and reside with him forever. So I'd like to, ter uh, to ask you to turn your Bibles to Genesis um, chapter 45. And we will pick up in verse 25. I know that some of you sometime in your life you had to bring a news and probably it was probably it was a sad news. Do you think it is easy to bring the news when somebody died and you have to call someone or you have to knock at the door and say, well, <clears throat> such and such, and if this is a close member of the family, if this person is related to you, and even if it is not related, to bring such a news, it's not an easy thing, right? So people wonder, how shall I approach? How shall I call? Um, um, I was talking with a friend of mine, and he was working in one foreign country. He was far from home, quite young. And one day his father called him, and said, um, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm driving. I'm driving people from work. So he was not just by himself. So he said, well, I'd like to talk with you something, but after you stop, after you arrive home. And he said, no, dad, tell me now. So his mother ended up in an accident, and she was in coma, and she was, so he wanted to know right away. But as a father, he, it was difficult to um, bring this news to someone who is very close. So these moments are difficult, especially when somebody dies. But did you think 
to bring a news that somebody was dead and now is alive. That, that somebody died and now was risen. Do you think how you would bring that kind of news? And this was the type of news that Joseph's brothers were supposed to bring to Jacob in Canaan, that Joseph is alive and well. And not just he is alive, that he is the prime minister of Egypt. In Genesis 45, verse 25, Actually, let's pick up in verse 24. And he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt, and came into the land of Canaan, and to Jacob their father. And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. So I assume this time Benjamin went with them. Simeon stayed from the last trip because uh, he was like a guarantor that Benjamin would come and the, the governor, the prime minister would see that they were not lying and the younger brother was at home and now he would come. So probably J Jacob was in age. So he was looking daily, I assume, to see. He was looking, isn't there a caravan coming? Isn't, uh, are, they, are they coming soon? So one day he saw the caravan coming. One day he saw that they were coming and they were, um, they were extremely happy. They were full of joy and happiness. So when they came, they, they were crying and saying, Dad, please sit down. We have a news for you. Sit down. So what happened, boys? says, Dad, Joseph is alive. He couldn't believe. He couldn't believe. The Bible says that the old Jacob, he fainted. He couldn't take it. He said, no, no, this can't be true. He is dead. I know it's over 20 years that he is dead. This can't be true. And the, the text continues, verse 27, And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. So, <clears throat> he couldn't believe at first. But the Bible gives us one element. Verse 27 says, And they told him all. What does that mean? What, what does, does it mean all? The truth. Thank you. So he told, they told him what Joseph had said. They, they told him how he is doing. But there was a big secret in Canaan that nobody knew beside the 11 boys. Big secret in Canaan, not in Egypt, to Joseph. So when the Bible says that they told him all, they had to tell him, this is what Joseph instructed them, when you go home to dad, you have to tell him what happened to me. And this was by God's providence. You wanted, uh, you wanted it bad, but it turned out to be good. You wanted me to die, but God made it that I am your provider. I am your protector. I like how Patriarchs and Prophets puts it. Page 232. Another act of humiliation remained for the ten brothers. They now confessed to their father the deceit and cruelty that for so many years had embittered his life and theirs. Jabe had not suspected them of of so base a sin, but he saw that all had been overruled for good, and he forgave and blessed his erring children. He didn't suspect it. Well, they lied to him so many years ago. It's about 22 years ago they lied to him, and probably Jacob remembered that he was also a liar 
sometime earlier in his life. So in a way, this tendency to lie or to deceive someone was passed on his children. So as parents, we should be very careful what example we will set for our children. I like what one brother said once. He told me, he said, look, even we as parents, if we have habits and still um, certain uh, things that we do or eat or drink and they are not good, we should not do in front of our children. I'm not saying that we should keep a secret life and still continue penetrating those sins or habits which are wrong. I'm not saying that, but if still we, we know that something is not good to eat and we still like it, we should not because we set an example. And it's very wrong. <clears throat> In the book God Sent a Man, page 164, Carlisle B. Haynes, he says, he says it this way. They had some things to make right there too. They had done him a wrong, grave wrong. It was not only the story of Joseph in Egypt they were going to have to tell their father. There was more than that he had to know. There was how Joseph got to Egypt. There was the pit and the sale into slavery and the deception and the big lie. Jacob was going to have to be told all that too. It could not be hid any longer. It, it had already been kept under cover too long. So do you think it was easy for the 11 brothers to come and say, Father, look, this is what we have done. And then Simeon would come up and say, Father, I wanted that we would kill him. And then the other one said, well, let's sell him into slavery. And Jacob was living for so many years with that lie, believing that Joseph was dead. Same book, 166. <clears throat> and then, doubtless, seeing the depth of his bewilderment, one of his sons said, Father, come outside and see. And they led him out. And he looked and saw that long line of wagons, equipped such as only royalty and the very wealthy could possess. So when Joseph sent them home, he didn't send them empty-handed. He sent corn and he sent bread and he sent lots of gifts and he sent a caravan of asses that would carry the whole family back to Egypt. So he sent all of these animals and um, means of transportation. See, this was the type of man Joseph was. He was very careful. He was very mindful how his father will travel. He knew very well that Jacob was not anymore a young man. He was in age. So he made sure the old father would be transported to Egypt in the best way and in the easiest way, he could travel. So he made sure he sent this caravan. The Bible says all of these wagons. When Jacob saw it, he said, this can be done only by Joseph. Actually, he had his faults. But the seed he planted in Joseph now is bringing results. The seed we plant in our children will bring results later on. Sometimes we want the best, and we invest the best, and we put the best, and still we get different results. There too was the long train of camels and she asses all loaded down with the good things of Egypt. He was, <clears throat> he was showing, uh, showing the changes of raiment and silver and provisions. <clears throat> Again, he was overwhelmed and convinced. His spirit revived. He began to grasp the immensity of this amazing thing, and he exclaimed, this is what Jacob would say, well, this is different. I can believe it now. Yes, this is just like Joseph. He would do a thing like this. 
Joseph, my son, is still alive. Very well, I will go and see him before I die. <clears throat> but I like what the scripture says in Genesis 45, verse 28. <clears throat> it says, And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see before I will go and see him before I die. <clears throat> this was an amazing news. When you live part of your life 20 something years believing that your beloved son the son from your beloved wife Rachel is dead. He was devoured by a wild beast because that was the message he's got 22 years ago, you know, from the boys. They found the uh, garment uh, full of blood, and the story was that he was caught by a wild beast, and that, that was the, the full story. That's what Jacob believed so many years. And now apparently they come back from Egypt with all of these <clears throat> gifts and caravan. And camels. And they say, Dad, Joseph is alive. He's the prime minister of Egypt. Don't you think that Jacob recalled those dreams 20-something years ago when Joseph, the young boy, came and say, said, Father, look what I have dreamed. Uh, uh, brothers, look what I have dreamed. Now he was the prime minister of Egypt. <clears throat> So next chapter, Genesis 46, from verse 1 to 4. <clears throat> the Bible says, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. <clears throat> Beersheba was the closest to Egypt in Canaan at the southern border. So just before you cross, from Canaan, it was Beersheba. And this place reminded him about his forefathers. Because his grandfather Abraham, he stopped at this, that place. Isaac stopped at that place. And Abraham brought sacrifices. This place was significant for the Jewish nation. And now as he is traveling to Egypt, he was not 100% confident in himself, that he should go down to Egypt. Because when Joseph told him, come down, this was not a short visit. This was supposed to be to move all the way. And actually what's interesting, because Pharaoh commanded and he said, tell your father to come, but let them leave all of their belongings. They don't need, I will provide for, for them. Jacob didn't pay attention to that. He took his uh, provisions. He took his goods and all the stuff he had, and now he's traveling. But he's still not convinced. He wants another yes. But that approval he is expecting from God. <clears throat> it, it's very significant. Before he steps into Egypt, he will bring one more sacrifice. So, brethren, before. In our lives, this is a good lesson for us. Before we make a decision, before we, we, we make a big decision in our life, choosing something, moving somewhere else, the good thing would be to follow as Jacob was doing. He was bringing a sacrifice. This means a prayer, a, the whole ceremony in, in those days to, to ask the Lord to ask for guidance. What would Yahweh say in this case? And we can see the response. Verse 2. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. A very interesting moment. Always when God wanted to confirm something, he would mention the name twice. Follow the Bible. There are more instances. I can bring examples. Whenever he wanted to say something very not because God is not confident what he's saying, but that the person would be truly uh, sure that this comes from God. He says, he, he, he calls him twice. He says, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. 
And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Which means when Jacob will give his ghost, Joseph will be present. Such a confirmation, it's powerful. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob now comes to him in a night vision. He says, Jacob, Jacob, don't be afraid. Don't be resistant. Don't go with second thoughts that maybe this is not my will. No, you go down into Egypt and I will go with you. You go as a big family and I will bring you out as a big nation. You go in hundreds maybe and I will bring you out in millions. Do we have the same message from our God? God says, you are a bunch of people here. But he says, go out in the world and preach the gospel. And you will be in dozens, but I will bring in hundreds, if not thousands. This is the same message. I will increase. I will go down with thee. And the Bible says that Jacob rose. He was confident now, and he is going down to Egypt. He is, he is continuing his journey with his uh, caravan and all his sons and uh, daughters-in-law and children and grandchildren, everybody is going down to Egypt. <clears throat> now we come to the point when they are approaching the, 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 the land of Goshen. This is part of Egypt. This is the northeast part of Egypt. By the way, as I said in the beginning, Joseph prepared them a place. Joseph was a smart guy. He was not only good-looking, very uh, full of wisdom, he was very smart. So before they came, he said, well, this is the best place. And he, he was thinking how he should put the story. And this was true. He was not lying. He would tell Pharaoh that they are shepherds. And shepherds for the Egyptians, they were not accepted. That's why this was a strategic plan that the people of Israel will, will not intermingle in marriage relationships and other rela relationships, but they would grow as a big nation in that part of the land. By the way, that part of the land <clears throat> is very rich. Egypt, it's a country um, located on desert. I have been on both sides. So now Egypt, you have the part on Africa's side, and then you have on Asia, which is Sinai Peninsula. That was part of Israel for some time, and then Egypt took it over. Sinai Peninsula is dry, Mount Sinai and <clears throat> dry land, rocks. Egypt has two parts, but that part where he was supposed to put his uh, family, it, was, uh, it had plenty of food. Brother, and I still remember the guavas I ate in Egypt, the pomegranate, and all of those fruits. They're amazing. I know some of you come from some countries where you have all of these fruits, but those fruits I ate in Egypt, they were amazing, local. So I believe where Joseph was preparing the place, they had this fertile land where Nile would come over, would irrigate the land, and everything would grow. They would have grass for their uh, uh, cattle and sheep and camels, whatever they were supposed to, to have. So in verse 28, Genesis 20, 46, And he sent Judah before him and to Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Whom did Jacob sent first with the news to bring the news to, to Joseph that we are coming, we are very close. We are approaching the land, uh, the, 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 the area of Goshen, Judah. Why Judah? We see that Judah 
plays a big role in the history of Israel, and not only then, even later. Who was supposed to be, from which tribe Messiah was supposed to be born? From the tribe of Judah. So Judah is sent with the message, Dad is coming soon. Be ready. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. So now here you come. <clears throat> the caravan is approaching the land of Egypt, the region of Goshen. Uh, Joseph comes into his chariot. He's a prime minister of Egypt with the entire, with the entire cortege of Demnitaries and soldiers and everybody is, is following him. And they come. And he doesn't want that dad would get out and come and meet him. He leaves everything behind. He comes to meet the old father. I'd like to read from um, some commentaries. First, Patriarchs and Prophets. 232, upon reaching Egypt, the company proceeded directly to the land of Goshen. Thither came Joseph in chariot of state, attended by a princely retinue. The splendor of his surroundings and the dignity of his position were alike forgotten. One thought alone filled his mind. One longing thrilled his heart. As he beheld the travelers approaching, the love whose yearnings had for so many long years been repressed would no longer be controlled. He sprang from his chariot and hastened forward to bid his father welcome. That's what Joseph did. God sent a man, page 174. The words are not spoken, says uh, uh, Carlisle B. Haynes, as these two looked into each other's eyes, their emotions overcame them. Words were too feeble to express the feelings that swept like overwhelming waves over their souls. They fell into each other's arms and remained there for a long time. While the Egyptian courtiers and the sons of Jacob looked on the scene with Streaming eyes. <clears throat> the record says, And he, Joseph, fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And oh, the thoughts that must have raised through their minds as they clung together in loving embrace. And finally, Jacob gently disengaged himself, pushed his beloved Joseph far enough away to look at him from head to feet and fastened his eyes on this boy he loved well, only then did he speak. When, when you read these words and, and you imagine the, 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 the situation, these two men embraced each other, hugged each other. The Bible says that, that he fell on his neck, on his father's neck, and he was crying, and they stood Still for a while. Why? They, they didn't have words to complete. The, they, they didn't have enough vocabulary to say, Dad, how much I missed you. Son, how much I love you. How much I missed you. You are dead and now you are alive. I lost you and now I found you. Brethren, don't you see a, a, a similarity here with the story of Jesus? He was dead. And now he's alive. I'd like to take you to the book of John. Come to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Chapter 19 tells us about the crucifixion and about the Calvary and how he died. And he was put in the tomb on the day of preparation. And then chapter 20, verse 1, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre. And see the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away 
the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter. Who is the other disciple? What do you think? Well, is the one who is writing this gospel. Of course, he was younger than Peter. You know, this was the youngest disciple. This is Apostle John. This is the young John. He overran, overruns Peter. He goes first to the sepulcher. And came first to the sepulcher, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. See, he is younger. He doesn't have so much experience. He is waiting for Peter. Then cometh Simon, P Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher <clears throat> and see if the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. What is the news in, in the Gospel of John? He was dead, but now he is alive. They, they couldn't find him. He was not anymore in the sepulcher. His, his garments, his um, linen clothes were nicely packed, nicely placed around the place where he was buried, but he was not anymore in the sepulcher. Be why? Because Christ was risen. If we go back to Genesis 46, verses 31, after they wept a while and they, they looked at each other. You know, when, when I look at Jacob, what, what reminds me, probably when he looked at Joseph, Joseph was about 39 years old when they met each other again. And Jacob was over 100 years old. Because Jacob will live another 17 years in Egypt. This was the most peaceful, the most quiet life in the, the life of Jacob. He had all of his children. His beloved son was the prime minister of Egypt. They had everything and they, although around was famine, they had food, not only for them, but for their cattle and everybody was happy, living a peaceful life. And now after they talked to each other, from verse 31, <clears throat> Genesis 46. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade have been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds all the, and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servants' trade have been about cattle from your youth, our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. They are telling the truth. They were shepherds. That's when... Joseph got in trouble. He went to visit his brothers. He went to take them food because they were taking care of the sheep. He gave them instructions. Very, very important instructions of what was going to, um, to happen next. Finally, I'd like to touch one final point here. See, Jacob was getting in age. He lived some more years with Joseph and his family in Egypt. And then Jacob will die in Egypt. He will make sure his bones will be carried back to uh, the cave of Machpelah in Canaan, where his forefathers were buried. But look what happens next. And this is the last lesson I would like us to learn today. In chapter 50, Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. And when Joseph brethren saw that their father was dead they said Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him and they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying 
Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of, the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. This was many years after they arrived in Egypt. Let's say about 17 years. And one day they come to Joseph. And they say, you know what? This is what our father said. If you can forgive us. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear not, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he com comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now, we know Joseph is a portrait of Jesus. Who was speaking kindly? Who was comforting people? Who was healing people? Who was supporting people? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same character we see in Joseph. When they came and they had doubts, they were questioning if he really, truly forgave them. This really made his face sad. This really brought some sadness to the life of Joseph because he noticed they, they were not confident of, of his forgiveness. Brethren, doesn't happen in our spiritual walk when we ask for forgiveness. God has promised he will forgive us and then we go again and again and we say, Lord, please can you of the same sins, if we didn't do it again, we should be confident that God has forgiven us. If he promised something, he is faithful to fulfill it. Patriarchs and Prophets 2.39 The life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. It was envy that moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him as a slave. They hoped to prevent him from becoming greater than themselves. And when he was carried to Egypt, they flattered themselves that they were to be no more troubled with his dreams. That they had removed all possibility of their fulfillment. But their own course was overruled by God to bring about the very event that they designed to hinder. So the Jewish priests and elders were jealous of Christ, fearing that he would attract the attention of the people from them. They put him to death to prevent him from becoming king. But they were thus bringing about this very result. This is powerful. So they wanted it for bad, and God overruled it for good. They wanted him dead, and God kept him alive. And not only alive, he put him prime minister. So in the case of Christ, they wanted him dead rather than alive. And by that, who, he, who Christ would become later on, the King of kings and the Lord of lo lords. So brethren, I'd like to leave you with 26 similarities. We had a long journey, about five studies, five um, uh, messages on the life of Joseph. There could be more. But I, I found 26 similarities in between Joseph and our Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph is the beloved son. Jesus, the, the, the beloved son, Matthew 3.17. Joseph was hated by his brothers. Jesus was hated by his own. Joseph went to find his brothers. Jesus went to find the lost sheep. Joseph is the obedient son. Jesus is the obedient son. Joseph's brothers will worship him. Jesus will be worshipped by every knee. Joseph brought them food. Jesus gave us the bread of life. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph's coat was soaked in blood. Jesus' coat was ripped apart. 
Joseph did the will of his father. Jesus fulfilled the will of his father. Joseph was saved by going to Egypt. Jesus was saved by going to Egypt. Joseph was serving as a slave diligently. Jesus came to serve humanity. Potiphar put everything under his control. God puts everything under Jesus' control. Hebrew 2.8. Joseph resisted temptation. Jesus resisted temptation. Mrs. Potiphar used his robe to cover her, her sin. And his brothers used his robe to cover their sin. Jesus uses his robe to cover our sins. And what's interesting, he will cover the sins of the Jews and the sins of the Gentiles. Joseph kept silent when he was falsely accused. Christ was silent when falsely accused. Jesus was for, Joseph was for three days in prison. Jesus was for three days in the tomb. Joseph is taking in one day from the prison to palace. Jesus is taking in one day from the tomb to heaven. After prison, Joseph is given a throne. After the tomb, Christ will receive the kingdom. After he was elevated, he is given a Gentile bride. After Jesus receives the kingdom, he is given a bride. After exaltation, he is given a new name. After his exaltation, he is given a new name as well. Joseph fed all the countries with bread and only hope. Jesus is the only hope for humanity and for the world. Joseph revealed, reveals himself to his brothers. Jesus revealed himself and said, I am Jesus. Come and touch it. Come said to his brothers, come to me. Jesus tells us, come unto me. Joseph sent the brothers with a message. Jesus sends you with a message. And the last one, Joseph forgave fully his brothers. And I want to conclude today, Jesus forgives you fully and complete. This is my message, my brothers and sisters. Dear guests today, if Christ promised that he will accept and forgive, let's hold by this promise and believe that he has the same power to forgive and forget and once give eternal life. Amen.